question? Small I was going to want to name that last one before you read the D. Okay. Listen up. We've got a problem. No one's here. A person was murdered yesterday. No, no, dun, dun, dun. A person was murdered here on campus yesterday. It was a member of the custodial staff. They were found in the halls. According to the security guards, there are three vehicles in the parking lot. Mr. Willis's car, Mr. Temple's car, and Miss Bradford's car. The victim was found in the hall with a broken test tube shoved through his chest. Miss Bradford, how could you? Test tube. Was it dirty? They looked under the victim's fingernails. And they found crusty bits of skin and blood under the victim's fingernails yeah, because the victim had scratched the attacker before he was killed. Yeah. You're supposed to do that, aren't you? Now, to solve a crime like this, what they have to do is they have to be able to take the, vic the, the DNA from under the victim's fingernail and they have to amplify it so they have enough to work with. And then they have to run what's called a DNA fingerprint. So I want to show you both those processes. And, uh, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. Wait, I have a question. Yes. What happens if, like, they don't know if either Lee or Mac killed someone and, like, they can't use DNA, right? Because That's right. These guys could do a crime with one another. They put them both under they, they, they have the same DNA. Yeah. Both guys. Show it to the kids. Yes. I'm going to tell you. We're going to figure this out. So. Here's the deal. <laughs> You're like, what the? Oh, hi, Hannah. <laughs> You're so quiet. Strong. Now. How is it? Well, so if the DNA is under the fingernail, then it's not strong. Uh, it's it survives intact for a good while. It can survive depending on what temperature it is. They found DNA in uh, mammoths uh, that have been buried under the ice for thirty thousand years. But you couldn't destroy it or something if you were trying to get the DNA out? You have to be very careful and you swab it off and it doesn't destroy very easily. Including dinosaurs? They've even found some dinosaur DNA. Wow. <laughs> Inside bones that are broken. Now listen up. So here's what you do. The first process you have to do if you find a little bit of DNA at a crime scene, y'all have to pay attention here. If you find a little bit of DNA at a crime scene, you have to amplify it. And the process for DNA amplification is called PCR. It was on your quiz. You should have read about it. Here's how PCR works. They take the DNA and they put it in a test tube. And all they need is one cell. Because every cell has a full complement of DNA from the person. So if they find a piece of hair or a lot of, a lot of crime scenes, the killer has thrown away a cigarette butt and they get some DNA off the cigarette butt. And they even had, uh, one time, a kidnapper mailed a letter into um, a ransom note, and they peeled off the stamp, and he had licked the stamp, and they got him that way. So all they need to do is they need to take a D the DNA, and they put it in a test tube. And then they put in also a bunch of free nucleotides. And you can get, obtain free nucleotides from any plant or animal just from a bunch of plant material. You just crush it up and spin it around in a centrifuge and get the nucleotides. And you put them in there with the DNA sample that you have. And you drop in a <coughs> DNA, a bunch of DNA polymerase enzymes. <laughs> and you get, they have special DNA polymerase enzymes that are heat resistant that they obtained from a type of bacterium that lives in hot springs. Thermos. Thermos, whatever it is. And it, uh, it, can, it, can, it has DNA polymerase that can resist heating. And we'll see that heat is used in this technique. I don't get how they get all these like, microscopic things into a test tube. Yeah, like, let's so throw it in. How do they throw in a DNA polymerase if you can't even see it? You get, you get a hole. You get trillions of them. Pour them all in there. But how do you get trillions of them separated from where yeah. we got them? Well, DNA polymerase <coughs> is found in the nucleus of cells. Mm -hmm. So all you got to do is get a bunch of nuclei of cells. Mm -hmm. 
And the way you separate things from one another is by weight. And you, there's, there's a machine called a centrifuge that spins things around, and the heavier stuff goes to the bottom of the tube, and the lighter stuff stays on top. And so for every little organelle that's in a, in a cell, they know how fast they have to spend it and, and where it will settle in this long tube. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so now that way, I have a centrifuge. I'll show you how it works. So now they can, they can get a bunch of DNA polymerase. They just have to crush up a bunch of cells and centrifuge it at the proper speed and then pull the, the DNA polymerase molecule out of there. And there's other ways to go about getting it, too. Centrifuging is kind of a simple method. So they have to stay in a solution to keep the DNA polymerase alive? Yeah, they, they keep it in a solution. So how would, how would that get in? Where the solution get in the DNA? Yeah, but that's fine. That's okay. Doesn't hurt the DNA. DNA's pretty tough. And so in the test tube, they got a bunch of free nucleotides. They got the little bit of DNA they found from the crime scene. They got a heat-resistant DNA polymerase. And then what they do is they heat the, the test tube up real hot. And, and all the molecules start vibrating. And this DNA polymerase is heat-resistant, so it's going to stay together real well. But the DNA strand, it starts vibrating like this, and when it gets hot enough, it comes apart. And it comes apart in the middle because that's where the weakest bonds are. So the whole DNA strand will separate like that. And then you cool it off, and there is a, there's also a special enzyme that adds what's called an RNA primer. And I didn't talk about this last time when we were talking about DNA replication. But you got to add a little bit, uh, uh, you also have to add an enzyme that adds this RNA primer. So you have to also have some RNA nucleotides. And this is also done in normal DNA replication. You got to add a little RNA primer. And then after that, the DNA polymerase will attach and will <coughs> start adding nucleotides on both sides. Well, what about the RNA? And the RNA is eventually removed. Hold on, let me add some nucleotides on both sides, starting at the primer. <coughs> ah. And so the, the DNA polymerase just runs down this side, and another one will run up the other side, and, and we'll have two copies. Another enzyme comes by and replaces the primers with nucleotides, too. These will eventually be replaced. So you got to have both of those enzymes in your... What's the point? The point is, we've now made copies of the DNA strand. Well, what's the point of putting the RNA on there if it's just going to be replaced the, by DNA? The only way DNA polymerase will work if there's already an RNA primer in place. Uh, and that's what really happens when we're copying DNA. I just didn't choose to show it to you then because we hadn't learned about RNA yet. So I'm just talking about it now. Is it DNA primer or RNA? It's an RNA primer. This, these blue nucleotides are RNA. Okay. So an RNA primer has to be added first. I don't really get what its purpose is. The purpose is we started with one strand of DNA, and now we have two. And are you just going to keep doing it over and over? Ah, and then we heat it back up and do it again. It takes five minutes to copy the DNA. And if you do that 20 times, you go from one DNA strand to two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1044, 2048, 4096, 8192, 16,384, 32,768, state championship match in 1986. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. 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 No, I can keep going forever. It just takes a long time to do the math. Two seconds each I didn't really get what the RNA primer's purpose was. The, uh, <coughs> RNA primer has to be in place before the DNA polymerase will start copying. We'll start adding nucleotides. So there's an enzyme that comes down and lays down the primer. And then the DNA polymerase can go and copy. Anywho, here's the point. You can copy the DNA over and over and make lots of copies using this PCR process.
And now you have plenty of DNA that you can work with. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take that DNA and we're going to do a what's called a gel electrophoresis. So let me show you a little video about PCR to kind of show you how this works. The polymerase chain reaction is a method for making many copies of a specific segment of DNA, starting with a very small amount. This technique can be used to identify specific microorganisms from a small amount of DNA, and to identify persons involved in crimes from DNA on cigarettes or in a single hair follicle. The DNA to be amplified is mixed with deoxyribonucleotides, a thermal stable DNA polymerase called TAC polymerase, and DNA primers. The DNA primers hybridize to the ends of the gene to be amplified and provide a starting point for the TAC polymerase. The mixture is heated to break the hydrogen bonds in the DNA, forming single-stranded molecules. The mixture is then cooled sufficiently to allow the DNA primers to anneal to each end of the segment to be copied. TAC polymerase then synthesizes the complementary strand of DNA using the primer as the starting point. The temperature is raised again to separate the DNA strands and then lowered sufficiently to allow the primers to attach. TAC polymerase now synthesizes another set of new complementary strands. This process is repeated until enough DNA has been produced to be identified or used for further research. After 21 cycles, one molecule of DNA can be amplified to over a million copies. This amount of amplification can be achieved by running the reaction overnight in a thermal cycler, an instrument that automatically raises and lowers the temperature at appropriate time intervals. I thought you said it was an RNA primer. Well, it is. It's, uh, it's RNA that primes the DNA, so they're okay. calling it a DNA primer. It's actually made of RNA. Okay. RNA DNA primer. Um, so, what do you then do? Well, then you can take your sample <coughs> and I'm going to use I'm going to use the uh, regular biology. Whoops. I have some pictures on my regular biology. Do we get to do a lab? Yeah, we're doing this in the lab next the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. We're going to do this. You want some cheesy boobs too? Yeah, I want cheesy boobs. We are going to do the PCR. Whoops, that's the wrong one. Fat guy in a little coat. Fat guy in a little coat. Oh, uh, here we go. Okay. We're going to run these things through a gel. We're not going to do the PCR because I don't have a thermocycler, which is a somewhat expensive piece of equipment. There are some high schools that have it, but um, uh, we'll, still do, we'll still run the gel. Um, and uh, the way this works is you take the DNA, once you've copied it a million times, let's pretend this is the DNA. We and pretend we've got a million copies of this. Okay? Are you all with me? Mm -hmm. Then we cut it with restriction enzymes. We, we put in, in the test tube with these millions of copies, we put in a restriction enzyme like EcoR1. And the EcoR1 is going to cut wherever it sees. G-A-A-T-T-C. And so if this were the DNA strand, it'll cut here, and it'll cut here. And this DNA strand will be cut in three pieces. And so will the million copies that we made. Then we take the pieces, and we put them into a gel. And what we do, and we'll do this in the lab, we pour a gel, it's like jello. You pour it into a box like that, and then it hardens. As it cools, it hardens, and you cut a little well into it. And you pour the DNA, this DNA here, you put it in the well. You squirt it in there with the pipette, 
and it fills up the well. And then you take this thing, and you can see it's hooked up to an electrical supply up there. You actually submerge this thing in a fluid. You submerge, uh, you have a, a box that contains a fluid, and so the gel is sitting in your, in your fluid. It's called electrophoresis buffer, this fluid. Do you heat it up and cool it? <laughs> no, you don't heat it up and cool it. What you do is you put an electric wire on each side. And, one, and this wire over here has a negative charge. And this wire over here has a positive charge. And the DNA is negatively charged, you see. Because these little phosphate, these little phosphate groups on the nucleotides, those are negatively <coughs> charged. Jessica, hang with me. It's not, not the time to fall asleep. You gotta, you gotta learn how this works. The little phosphate group is negatively charged. So the DNA being negatively charged, when you turn the power on in this gel box, the DNA is going to move away from the negative wire because like charges repel one another. And positive attracts negative. So the DNA is going to start moving that way. And it will go right through the gel. Even though the gel is thick, the DNA, there are little tiny microscopic holes in it, and the DNA will kind of migrate through those little holes. Now the pieces that are big, they move real slowly through the gel. And the pieces that are small, they move real quickly through the gel. And so after you run this DNA, for this example I've used, there would be three lines. There'd be a line here where the large fragments went, and then two lines further down where the small fragments went. And that's this individual's DNA fingerprint. Let's say it's Mr. Temple's. Uh-oh. Uh, well, no, we just ran Mr. Temple's DNA. And then next to it, in another lane, we run Mr. Willis's DNA. <laughs> now, Mr. Willis's A's and T's and C's and G's are different from Mr. Temple's. So they might cut my DNA, it might cut my DNA in a different location. So I have different sized pieces in my DNA fingerprint would be different. So here's what the results look like. Here's the gel, you see. And so they, for instance, they've lined up here a lot of suspects. Um, that's Hannah, she was around two. And there's Lee's DNA, and there's Miss Bradford's, and there's Mr. Temple's, and there's um, Stephanie's, and there's mine. And there's what was found under the victim's fingernails. It matches mine. I'm the killer. And so I get a knock on my door while I'm teaching class, and it's a couple gentlemen carrying firearms. And they say, sir. Your DNA matches the sample that was found under a dead guy's fingernails. Care to explain how that happened? And I go, <laughs> and they go, freeze, buddy. Ah, <laughs> oh, I'm hit. And there's a whole like music playing. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Wouldn't that be a good show? Yeah. Why'd you do it? Why did you do this crazy? He wasn't cleaning the lab. They would arrest you before they asked you about it. Yeah, they probably would. <laughs> but not in the movie that I'm making. In strands of DNA, they learn to cut them into segments. We're going to do this next week. They chemical scissors called restriction enzymes to cut the DNA into fragments. The fragments can then be loaded into tiny wells in a thin agar gel That's DNA. and then separated using a weak electrical current. The shorter the DNA fragment, the farther it travels across the gel. Under ultraviolet light, the individual pieces of treated DNA glow brightly. technician finds the piece of DNA she wants and carefully cuts it out. 
since the mid nineteen seventies using techniques like these biotechnologists have learned to isolate specific fragments of d n a or genes and then transfer them to entirely different plants or animals they can now combine the most desirable characteristics of two different species into the offspring why does it move through the gel because there's you put two electric wires here that are charged and the DNA is negatively charged you see so if you apply a negative charge here the DNA will move away from that charge how did Mo Who was asking that question? Hannah. Who? Hannah. Hannah, okay. Does that make sense? Why it moves through? How did Mollus um, figure that out? What Mollus came up with PCR. Mollus came up with so this. Was, okay, so I'm sorry. So how did... Copying the DNA. How did they figure that out? I don't know. Some smart guys are working with DNA. One of the cool things is this has all come about in the last 30 years. I didn't learn about this when I was in high school. This didn't exist. So what did you what did you learn about instead of this? We just didn't learn it. We spent more time on plants and stuff. Mammal studies. But this is incredible. This is this has been used not only to put people in prison but to exonerate people. After the electric chair. Here's a here's a little video talking about that. Have nope, you ever seen nope. the movie The Fugitive with Harrison Ford? Yes. That was based on a real case where a guy, a doctor, came in and found his wife dead. And they arrested him for killing her. Put him in jail and he spent his life in jail. Because he touched the gun, right? Or he picked the gun? I don't, yeah, I think he did, yeah. Yeah. And so his fingerprint was on the gun or something. And uh, his son finally had him exonerated by DNA evidence. The blood that the wife had cut the killer and then spilled blood out in their apartment, the blood wasn't the doctor's blood. They had no way of proving that back then because they had the same blood type. So he ended up dying in jail and his son finally had to prove him innocent. He spent like 30 years in jail before he died. The electric chair got him. Here's kind of a scary video. present at every crime scene, just waiting to tell its secrets. Because DNA is found in each and every part of us, it's more likely to be left behind than fingerprints. Detectives collect DNA from blood, hair, even the saliva left on the back of old postage stamps. Gathered samples are x-rayed and analyzed. The black bands show the pattern of chemicals that make up the rungs of an individual's ladder of DNA. This sample was taken from a violent crime scene. And this sample came from a suspect. If the two match, the suspect will most likely become the accused. Unless a sample's contaminated, DNA doesn't lie. Collecting DNA from crime scenes is now standard police procedure and the FBI considers DNA its best crime-solving tool. In 1994, a new software program helped law enforcement agencies share DNA evidence. Called CODIS, the program compares samples taken from a crime scene with any and all other samples stored in the system. Criminals are turned in by their own genes. When the computer finds a match, it's called a cold hit. Already, CODIS has solved over 300 crimes. Even old unsolved crimes can be reopened with DNA evidence. In 1954, the murder of Marilyn Shepard put her husband, Dr. Sam Shepard, behind bars. Convinced of his father's innocence, Shepard's son pursued the case even after Sam Shepard died. DNA tests proved that Sam Shepard's defense had been the truth. Someone else had entered his home and murdered Marilyn. 
DNA taken from blood at the crime scene did not match Shepard's or his wife's. Nowadays, if, if they arrest a guy, convicts a felony, they'll take a DNA sample from him, run it through a gel, and put the results in a computer. So if he ever gets out and commits another crime, and they find the DNA, they'll know who did it. I think they ought to take DNA from every person. But people argue that that's against their uh, rights, and and so that's the kind of thing, these ethical issues that they've well, we, well, we, uh, I watched one, one of these, these things where uh, they, the suspect, like, he wouldn't let them get his DNA, so they just have some people follow him around to like he like drank something from a cup and then, and then threw it, it out and then they get it. Yeah, cup. absolutely. Yeah, because if once it's thrown in the garbage can, it's it's not your property yeah. anymore. Yes. Did you have something? Um. Yeah. What would be the issues with uh, having everyone's DNA taken and putting on records? Something about pr private rights. Do, or do you own your DNA, or can yeah. anyone look at it? And there's other issues. I'm going to show you another video here. Um, insurance companies. See, nowadays they can read the entire, your entire DNA strand and they can compare it to people who have certain genetic diseases. Oh, and they can figure and out. And so an insurance company can say, hey, you have a high risk of heart disease. We're not going to insure you because they know your DNA code. Uh -oh. You see what I'm saying? Oh, do, oh, do insurance companies, they don't have that yet. They don't have that yet, but, but if everybody... If everybody had given a DNA sample to the government, people are scared that they might give it to them or they might get yeah. access to oh, okay. it. Yeah. yeah. It reminds me of that, that Michael Crichton book. You read it next. That was, no, that was but last, I've heard about that was it. the last book he wrote while yeah. he was still alive. But, huh. but I mean, they talked all about this, like people in hospitals yeah. who had surgeries and the uh, companies took their took their genes and made right. products out of it. And they were trying to sue sue the companies for stealing their their uh, their stuff. If you ever see the movie Gattaca, <coughs> Gattaca is about this kind of thing, where the, where everybody's DNA is is uh, on file and, and you can do a quick DNA scan and tell things about people. Um, somebody in here has rented Gattaca and not returned it. Oh yeah? Have you watched it? I watched most of it. Can you watch it and return it? Yeah. Watch this. This is about this sort of thing and some of the ethical issues involved. Savannah, are you sleeping? Savannah sleeps instead of Savannah smiling. Hi, I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your host of Nova Science Now. I like this guy. It yeah. seems like every week, scientists uncover more secrets of our DNA, revealing how our genetic code can help shape and influence our lives. And for some, this is scary, raising fears that insurance companies or employers might see our genetic profile and hold it against them. Well, Mr. DeGrasse Tyson, I've seen your genetic profile, and it's not pretty. In fact, you're much too much of a genetic risk for us. But some say that knowing our genetic risk for disease will actually lead us to longer, healthier lives. Well, Neil, I've reviewed your genome. Here are my recommendations. And we prepared a bottle of vitamins, especially for you. Well, thank you. Live long and prosper. So what can genetic testing actually tell us about our chances for a long and healthy life? And will that knowledge help us or hurt us? It's Time Magazine's Invention of the Year. No, it's not the electric car or the bionic hand. It's not even Hulu. It's the personal DNA test. A bunch of new companies are claiming they can read your DNA and tell you all kinds of things about yourself. And it seems everybody wants to know what might be hidden in their genes. Larry King, the founders of Google, supermodel Naomi Campbell, and Ivanka Trump, they've all signed up to get their DNA done. But what can these tests really tell you about you? To find out, I got one of the tests. There was just one thing I needed to do. Spit. You have agreed to provide us with a saliva sample. And spit. Spit. Correct. All I had to do was spit into a tube and send it to a lab in California. 
where they extracted my DNA. DNA is made of long strings of four chemicals, best known by their initials, A, C, G, and T. The six billion letters in the human genome encode the instruction for building our bodies and keeping them running. Everybody's DNA is mostly the same. Here and there, a letter or more will be different. Those subtle variations are what make you and I unique and different. But it's also what predisposes individuals subtly to these common diseases. This lab compared the letters of my DNA to the letters of people who have some common diseases. And then predicted my chances of getting sick. That would tell me I'm at a higher risk than the population on average. They said I had less than a 5% chance of getting Alzheimer's disease. But more than a 25% chance of getting diabetes or having a heart attack in my lifetime. I wondered what all these percentages really meant. So I asked my friend, Stephen Pinker, Harvard professor of psychology. He had taken the test and got back an even longer list. Here's one of my favorites. So I had the gene that gives me double the risk of baldness. My risk based on a single gene would be 80%. An 80% chance of being bald? Steve's got more hair than your average rock star. Oh, I get stopped all the time with, gee, you look like Jimmy Page and Robert Plant and Roger Daltrey. He was even featured on mulletlovers.com as the stud mullet. <laughs> so what's up? The invention of the year? A personal DNA test? Telling Steve Pinker he should be bald? What does it mean that I have an 80% risk of baldness? I clearly have a 0% risk of baldness. And if that seems so wrong, what about the disease risks I was given? Where does 50% live? Well, a lot of experts say they're about as accurate as Steve's baldness prediction. The fact that they're telling people the percent chance of getting a disease in their life right now, it's laughable. We know that a few diseases, like sickle cell anemia and Huntington's disease, are caused by one faulty gene, and DNA tests do a good job predicting them. But many geneticists, like Rudy Tanzi, say that for most common illnesses, the tests still aren't very useful for prediction. I don't think it's possible, no matter how much money you spent right now, with any direct DNA service, to get any reliable information about your risk for the most common age-related diseases. But why not? Why can't common diseases like cancer and diabetes be predicted by looking at your DNA? Well, here's the problem. There's six billion letters in your DNA. Strings of these letters can make up a gene. Altogether, you have maybe 20,000 genes that tell your cells how to build different proteins, like collagen for your skin or hemoglobin for your blood. Some genes make switches that can turn other genes on or off. Inside our cells, every second, thousands of genes are interacting with one another. We've now mapped the human genome. So we have a pretty good list of all the different genes. But we don't know how they all work together. It's kind of like a supermarket with thousands of different ingredients. Just as it takes a bunch of different ingredients from the shelves to make a cake, it takes groups of many human genes all working together to produce a human trait like baldness. And it takes another big group to produce a complex illness like heart disease. We know that the recipe for DNA sequences into flesh and blood is extraordinarily complex. You have one gene that might affect the expression of a second gene, which might modulate the expression of a third gene. When we say diabetes or heart attack or cancer or asthma are genetic, we mean that there are a lot of genes. They each have often small effects that add up, that lifestyle and environment matter, and a big dose of random chance. If the recipes for common diseases are this complicated, can we ever figure them out? Can knowing our DNA ever help us understand disease? George Church thinks it can. 
George has launched the Personal Genome Project to gather the evidence to answer all kinds of questions about how our bodies work. It might reveal why a guy like Steve, who has a gene that's supposed to make him a good jumper and sprinter, is just as lousy at basketball as George, who lacks that gene. More importantly, the project aims to collect enough DNA data to uncover the true complex causes of disease. But first, George needs to convince volunteers to give him their DNA. We have 10 that have actually been through the full experience. I'm one of the tenants. He's one of the tenants. Yeah. Yeah. So you're telling me our whole understanding of the human race now? <laughs> you both of the I, I, I think we need a lot more. A lot more than that. When he says a lot more, he means a lot more. He wants to sift through the DNA of 100,000 people. You might need that many because genetic diseases can involve so many different ingredients. It might take a huge study to reveal them all. And if we're going to decipher the complete recipe for disease, then participants, like Steve, need to share much more than their DNA. To really make this valuable, they, we can't just have DNA, we need to have their traits. As comprehensive a set of traits as possible, their medical characteristics, their physical characteristics. How about the environment? Do you care about the environment? The environment is very important. We want to capture that. So it's a huge questionnaire, then. You name it. It's on George Church's questionnaire. Past diseases, medications, waist size, what you eat, what you smoke. Researchers want to know all of it because the recipes for disease include your environment and your behavior in addition to your genes. And here's the kicker. George Church wants to put all that information on the internet. Someone can literally Google my genome. This information will be visible to anyone with an internet connection. So a billion people will be able to look at my genome. Steve did opt to keep a gene private, one that involved Alzheimer's disease. But other than that, his DNA is out there. Please welcome Stephen Pinker! You had your genome sequenced and then you put it on the internet. Are you crazy? That's like, that's like posting the social security number that God gave you. I mean... Colbert is not the only guy who thinks Steve Baker's crazy. I think there's a tremendous amount of fear and even paranoia about how our genetic information could be used against us. What happens if all that info winds up in the wrong hands? Say, your health insurance company or your employer. A new law signed last year, GINA, protects only against some genetic discrimination. Genetic information is not properly protected yet. For example, health insurers can't discriminate based on DNA, but life insurers can. Until I know for sure that someday there's absolutely no discrimination where there's a, uh, let's say, an amendment that uh, one cannot be discriminated against according to race, color, creed, and DNA sequence. Until that day, I don't want my name associated with my DNA sequence. Even beyond discrimination, there's another fear. Genetic engineering. Creating super babies. If it's good to We've seen it play out in the movies. We want to give you a child with the best possible start. You have a specified hazel eyes, dark hair, and uh, fair skin. I'm taking the liberty of eradicating any potentially prejudicial conditions. Uh, pretty much for bald and smiling. Alcoholism, addictive susceptibility. 